Hi, we're here today to look at the 2021 Standish Shiraz release. We do this every year. It's the highlight of my tasting year or one of the highlights. It's very exciting to look at these wines. And today is May the 4th. So these wines were released to the mailing list on May the 2nd. And I was up early, like I'm sure all of you were. We were out camping. I was out camping with my family. We're in the bush. So reception was pretty sketchy, but I was out there on my phone you know, adding to cart each of these wines sight unseen. I have not seen these wines um, either from barrel or at the winery prior to release. I'm looking at them for the very first time here this morning as I talk to you. I called um, Dan this morning uh, just to chat with him and to get a little bit of some, you know, updated information on on um, winemaking, a whole bunch, vintage, etc. from him. And um, I said, have you got five minutes? And he's like, oh, I'm pretty busy. I'm in the vineyard picking lamella. And I was like, wow. May 4th, of course, it's a very late season in the Barossa 2023. It will be very interesting to see how the wines from this year pan out, not just for Standish, but for all of the producers. They've really had some highs and lows this season, so it'll be cool to see how the wines pan out. For those of you that are new here, my name is Erin Larkin. I'm an Australian wine writer. I'm proud to review the wines of Australia and New Zealand for Robert Parker Wine Advocate. And this YouTube channel is my personal outlet for discussion, tastings, and videos on wines and topics that excite and titillate me. So let's dive into it. In this video, we're going to talk about the 2021 vintage and what made it so special. I'm going to touch on the winemaking, the vineyards, how these wines look in the glass, how the 2021 vintage compares to 2019, 2020, and of course, the, the great 2018 vintage. Um, I'm going to talk about service. I'm going to talk about the difference between service for friends and service for review, which is a question that I get so frequently, um, particularly on my Instagram account. So if you follow me on social media, you'll see that I talk about this quite a bit when I, um, through my stories. So let's dive in. So the 2021 vintage in the Barossa was brilliant. And when I say the Barossa, I'm of course referring to the Barossa zone, which encapsulates Eden Valley and Barossa Valley. So when we talk about yields, because we know that the 2020 um, vintage was incredibly low yielding, um, you know, down 70% in the Lamella Vineyard in 2020 from normal, we're looking at 111% increase on the 2020 yields in 2021 at Crush which is 19% up on the five-year average. And in, in the Eden Valley, i.e. the Lamella in this instance, um, Eden Valley was 167% up on the yields of 2020, which is 12% above the five-year average. So talking a little bit about vintage 2021 and what made it so special. So the lead up, you have to consider when we're talking about wine vintages in the Southern Hemisphere, we talk about a straddle of two years. We talk about this winter and spring, which is really important when we talk about um, rain, hail, storms, etc. Um, of the end of the 2020 year, leading into the growing season, which is January, February, March, April and May this year, um, of the, the vintage that we call the 2021 or the year that we're drinking. So rains in winter and spring leading into the growing season were like good, which meant that the ground was ready because it was a very dry but cool and mild Indian summer. And when we say Indian summer, it wasn't too hot. There were no major heat spikes through January, which of course in the Barossa really can happen. It can easily get over 40 degrees as it did in, in 20, but in 2021, no, it was like low 30s um, as the top. We look at a lack of hail and frost through bud bursts, which meant that yields were good, fruit set was good. There wasn't a lot of rain at the end of the season, which meant that the berries weren't bloated and fat. Um, interesting to see how the 2023 vintage goes. I haven't asked, I haven't, you know, specifically spoken to anyone about it, but there have been quite a few rain events through the, the harvest picking times um, end of the season. So it'd be interesting to see what they do with bloated berries effectively. It's more water content, less flavor. There'll be things they'll have to do to mitigate that. So essentially the 2021 vintage was just so kind of long and composed that what we have is the opportunity for producers to make all of the decisions they want to make based on their own stylistic preferences for their wines. This can be brilliant when we're looking at producers like Standish. Dan's been making wine a long time. He's very experienced. He knows what he wants. He knows what he likes. These seasons are Goldilocks years for those producers. They do what they want and we often get very balanced and beautiful wines as a result. Um, sometimes producers can take advantage of the season and do some pretty like wacky out there stuff. Um, 
sometimes hit and miss for me, but uh, we will see how that plays out as more of the wines are released. So winemaking. So these wines, um, I like this bit. They're all kind of the same, apart from this one, which has one alternate vessel in it, which is a concrete egg, um, which is used for one subplot in the vineyard, um, Marinanga. Uh, all of these wines are kind of made the same way. So they're hand-picked, wild fermented and open-top fermenters. They're put into a combination of four different coopers. That matrix sort of changes, but they stay as those four coopers in order to allow the vineyards to kind of rise above the oak. And they stay in oak or egg in this instance um, for 18 to 22 months. Basically, this is essentially it. And I like that because it means that when we're tasting the differences in the glass, when it's all Shiraz, with the exclusion of this wine, which has Bionia in it, we really are looking at the differences in area and in um, soils and in flavour. And I like that. It's really a nerdy way to look at wine. So starting in the first glass, this is the 2021 Lamella. It is 14.9% alcohol on the label, as is the Standish, as is the Schubert's Theorem. And the vineyard um, that the fruit for this wine comes from is in the Eden Valley. So it's the owned by the Angus family, the Hutton Vale Farm vineyard, and it was planted with cuttings from the Mount Eddleston vineyard from Henschke, as we know. Um, I really like this wine every year. It's the only wine in the lineup to feature a hundred percent whole bunch. And sometimes that character for me can feel a little overt. Now I know there are wonderful producers in the Rhone, in the Northern Rhone, um, that utilize hundred percent whole bunch. These are very elegant, highly sought after wines. I love drinking them, no question, but I can sometimes feel that in their youth, the whole bunch component overrides the terroir characteristics. And when we talk about Eden Valley terroir, what I want to see in the Shiraz is the dirt. It's got this really kind of, it, obviously you've been up there, for those of you who haven't, it's really kind of evocative. If you think of what old Australia country looks like, not the desert, the bush, this is sort of what the Eden Valley looks like. There's these old gum trees that kind of rise out of the ground. There's there's rocks and boulders everywhere. You sort of walk over quartz. Sorry. It's a really um, evocative and quite romantic place for me. I really love going up there. And the wines are really elegant and have a very clear stamp of regionality on them. And that is often Earl Grey tea, graphite, raspberry, a little bit of licorice, the star anise. These are quite mineral, um, big, but mineral and black and elegant wines as opposed to the Barossa Valley, which is um, lower altitude and far more earthy and red fruited and, and kind of muscly, you know. It's a bit lean and sort of bony up there. The soils are old podzolic soils and, and the wines have a bit of a boniness about them and I think that's really cool. So this year, this is very elegant and very svelte. I feel like um, having obviously just looked at this wine this morning and now um, that the whole bunch is really far more integrated than I've seen it on release in previous years. It's super elegant and pretty. This is really, really long and composed and beautiful. Um, over the evolution of um, opening this wine, and we'll touch on this a little bit more in, in the service part of this video, but... I poured this wine, it's now 11am, I poured it at sort of 8am, it's been in the glass for, for three hours now um, and it's really, it's really gone through quite a stylistic, um, sorry, an evolutionary arc. What I had at the beginning was this very beautiful, vibrant, poppy, um, bright, elegant wine. About an hour and a half in, the whole bunch was really quite pronounced. The tannins were far firmer and the wine had an almost gravelly aspect. Now that has settled down again and I'm seeing a combination of that beautiful, vibrant sort of poppy kind of fruit, the beautiful structure that I got sort of an hour and a half in. The wine is now taking both of those moments together and is sort of ameliorating into this very elegant, svelte, polished wine. I think this is a a super wine it always is, but um, it captures um, Eden Valley beautifully. And and for me, um, going back to whole bunch, I sometimes get a little anxious when I see a cool vintage with a lot of whole bunch because I think, you know, what if those stems haven't fully lignified and you get that sappy green kind of character, which makes me really nervous because it gives me the same little red flag wearing red thing as um, Brett. It's got, that, it's got that sappy sort of character and I don't see any of that here. In fact, I would suggest that because this is the last vineyard to be picked in the lineup, 
um, those stamps really have fully lignified and um, and even maybe, you know, more so than previous vintages. I don't know, but it tastes very, very harmonious to me. Moving into the second wine, this is the 2021 Standish, also at 14.9% alcohol. This, um, this is routinely the big, intense, muscular, stocky wine of the lineup. This is from the Laycock family vineyard in, um, in Greenock and was the very first wine that Dan released back in 1999. Um, this wine features, as did the 2021 before it, 30% whole bunch. And I usually, like I say, I usually say this is the big muscular, stocky kind of wine. But here, in this year, it's it's lighter. It is lighter. It doesn't have the dense baritone of, of like rich earth that it normally does. It doesn't kind of punch like it does, like it can. You know, it's much more um, pretty. It's a pretty wine. I wouldn't normally say that the Standish is pretty, but it, it is. Courtesy of, of the, the region of Greenock, it's got a really lovely kind of Moroccan sumac kind of spice to it. It's raspberry and licorice, but it's, it's red earth, it's dust. You know when you go to the Barossa in the middle of summer, I don't know if you do this, but it's a very exciting time because the vines look like they're supercharged and it's hot and there's a red dust that kind of whips up with the wind. I love it. It's, an, it's a really beautiful place and it has this kind of grounding aspect to it and that's sort of what this wine can have. Um, yeah, really, really wonderful and very pretty. Nicely done in 21. I like it. Uh, moving into the third wine. So this is routinely one of my favorite wines. I'm kind of smiling when I think about this wine because this is, to me, um, the wine that you seem to always be able to get after release. You, the Lamella sells out and, you know, everyone's hankering after it. The Standish, same. People want that wine because it's the first historic wine that he made and it's a wonderful kind of true representation of Australian Shiraz, Barossa Shiraz. Um, and then the Relic, which is one of the world's great Shiraz Viognier wines. And then the Schubert's just sometimes gets a little lost in there, I think. But if you know, you know. And that's a really bloody smart wine. And I think I have never seen it look so good as I have in 2021. So this is from the Ronenfelt Road Vineyard in Marinanga. It features 70% whole bunch as it did in 2021. And this is the only wine of the lineup that features an alternate maturation vessel. So the northeast corner of that vineyard um, is picked and put into concrete egg as opposed to oak. Um, and what that does is really retains that core of of blue fruit. Now, if, if, you, if you've been to the winery in the Barossa and you've seen he's got those glasses um, with the dirt in them from each of the vineyards, the black sparkly one that you kind of look at and go, wow, is that really from the ground? That is from this vineyard. And the wine, I, I always find that a very clear connection for me because the wine has that character. It's It's got like blue fruit. It's a galaxy of, I always think of galaxy and stars and universe and expansion with this wine because it's it's black like the middle of the night but it's pure and it's clean and it's pretty and it's mineral and there's graphite and it's really really exciting and for me it just really teeters on the brink of like it's got so much fruit power but it's got really lovely kind of ductile, pliable tannins that support it. It's pure, it's big, but it's not overweight. It's just a really wonderful wine. And I think this year it's like hit its straps in terms of, in terms of balance, I suppose. It's a really, 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 really super wine really excited. Uh, and finally, we have the wine that was my top wine of the, the range last year. We've got the 2021 The Relic. So this is 15.5% alcohol. And I think there's a common misconception around cool vintages that there will be low alcohols that accompany. But when you have a vintage like 21, where you didn't have to pick for any kind of reason, you weren't trying to mitigate oncoming rain or there was no mildew or, or, or trouble in the vineyard of any kind, you were just able to leave the grapes on the vine. I think that what you what you see in the case of a wine like this is very ripe, beautiful, fresh wine. Very ripe, but fresh. I mean, these are freshness. I really, as I get older and I drink more wine and I love it so much, freshness is the thing that really 
titillates me. And the longer, the older the wine is and the fresher that it is over that period of time, that is what excites me. The balance has to be there. But if it's balanced and then fresh, oof, exciting. So this, this is creamy and rich last year. It was savory. I remember it intimately. It had like bacon fat and roast beef crust. And it was really kind of dense and, and intense and floral, but really much more dense this year. It's creamy and pillowy and enveloping and generous and plump. And it doesn't have an overt Viognier character. You know, it's 1% co-fermented Viognier, but it's not, it doesn't sit on top of the wine like it can sometimes. And 1% sounds like not very much, but it's heaps. I mean, we look at the, you look at Gigal and the Lala's and, and the inclusion can be up to, to 11% or even slightly more, I think, from memory. But, you know, and that's a lot of Viognier, but in Australia... There's so much fruit flamboyance that I think the less Viognier, the better. You know, Clonic Killer, one of the country's great Shiraz Viognier wines, employs like 5 or 6%, which is still half of what the Northern Rhone grape producers are doing. So it's a really interesting thing to consider how much Viognier goes in and how much impact that tiny amount has. For me this year, this is a super wine. This is going to, for anyone that loves big, rich flavour some wines. This wine is going to really excite you, I think, because this is the biggest wine in the 2021 range. It's got the most volume and the most extension, but it's elegant and balanced as well. So I think um, really that's what the 2021 vintage might be known for is the, is the balance. Um, so let's then talk about how 2021 compares in the glass to 20, 19 and 18 is a very recent snapshot of vintages. So you know that the 18 vintage is one of my favorites. It was ripe, but fresh. So what we had was all of these kind of vital red fruited wines, really kind of core of raspberry and, and vitality. They were lovely wines, but because it was a warm year, really good kind of ductile splay of tannin, very supportive, beautifully balanced wines. Um, and kind of like something you can sink your teeth into. I love the 18s. I forever love the 18s. I can't wait to look at them in 2028 as 10-year-old wines and see how they've really been aging because I still, I still get sent 2018 current release vintages and they're still looking excellent five years on. So 2018, pretty high speed, super, super wines. Um, can't get them anymore. They're like hen's teeth. So I hope you've got some in your cellar. 19 was the first of the two um, drought years and it was really warm. The wines were concentrated and intense. I was just looking on the Wine Advocate website um, last night to see my reviews of the 20s and I noticed the 19s haven't been done, which is a, um, a crossover of me and Joe Savinsky that, um, that exchanged regions. Joe, used, he's our chief editor and used to review Australia when I came on board the 19 slipped through the crack. So I'm going to have to look at those wines again um, and review them for the advocates so that we have an unbroken chain of vintages. Uh, very important that we do that. But from my memory, those wines were really kind of brooding, dark, dense, muscular, big wines, big wines. 20, even less yield, um, even more compression, even more power, even more concentration. These wines were full on but beautiful, they're beautiful, kind of haunting, but really like achingly concentrated wines um, and really like everything had really been compressed into, into itself. Tannin, flavour, acid, the whole thing was just so compact. I think although these two vintages were very warm vintages, um, I think they'll be really, really wonderful wines to look at in sort of five and ten years' time. I think that the there's so much to uncoil and to unpick with those wines that they'll be very long lived and then we have 21 so it's a very very elegant season the wines are fresh balanced they're lighter than 20 and 19 they don't have the baritone that supported those vintages they still have the same beautiful ductile framework of tannin the core of fruit is pristine in each of these um it's a superstar vintage, no question. And the cool thing about 21 is, as we discussed in the beginning of this video, is the yields were up on both 20 and 19, not hard, I know, but yields were up, but the quality was very good. And if I had to compare this vintage in the Brossa to another region um, internationally, I might be inclined to compare it to the 2004 vintage in Champagne. Yields were very high that year, but the quality was very good across the region and the wines are excellent. They're still aging beautifully if you've got much 2004 in your cellar if you're still able to find them every now and again those wines are aging 
beautifully, a really wonderful vintage um, and really good yields, which means that we can probably still buy them around the place. And I hope that that will be the case for the 2021 reds from the Barossa Valley. Now, service and service for review, what they are and how they differ. So service for friends, for dinner, for me, for, for my own pleasure in my life. I would open these wines in the morning. I like to open not just one, but a couple if ever I'm serving them, because I, I think that one wine can just be drunk and enjoyed, but two or three are compared and discussed. And I think that's more interesting and more exciting. So I try and open a couple if I can at a time. Um, my method is to open them, pour a smaller pour than this um, in the morning, in a glass, taste it, enjoy it, think about it, whatever, but put the cork back in without decanting it. I'll often like tip the bottle up and get a bit of oxygen, get that bit of oxygen into the wine and then I'll leave it. I'll leave it in this room, which is always air conditioned and cool um, and just let it settle over the day because what I want when I'm serving it at dinner is for each of those wines to have the time and space to evolve in the glass. It's far more exciting to do it that way. I enjoy it, other people enjoy it, and invariably when you get to the bottom of the glass, eh, bottom of the bottle, um, that's when the wine looks the best. I was recently in Paris and went to Willie's Wine Bar. If you've been to that place, it's super cool and you'll know it and love it. It's a really beautiful place. Um, I went with a friend in who lives in Adelaide and, and we got a bottle of 2012 Jamais from Northern Rome from Coroti. And beautiful, 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 beautiful wine difficult to overstate how incredibly beautiful this wine was but we didn't decant it we just drank it in very little we drank the bottle we drank it in very little um pours like this and just let the wine aerate every time we poured it, it took us maybe an hour and a half I suppose um and by the end of that bottle that last glass was reaching unicorn status it was outrageous um but I really like the build-up it's like all good things come to those who wait, you know, and if I was just served that last glass first, would I have appreciated it? I'm not sure, but I really loved that slow build, that slow build of pleasure. It was super. So really incredible wine and something that I think about when I think, how do I serve a wine? I want that. I want that full story rather than just skipping to the end. But how does that differ from my service for a for review. So when I'm reviewing these wines, um, I will pour them, taste them, write the tasting note. Now these bottles, I'm going away this weekend and don't have the time to look at these wines like they deserve. So I have poured them this morning, gassed them immediately with 100% argon. I've got a rig just here, um, full gas bottle rig with a regulator and stuff. I've gassed those bottles and we'll look at them next week. Um, and when I review them, that's how you'll read the note. That's how I do it every year. I think that it gives all of these wines, um, whether it's a you know, premium Chardonnay, premium Shiraz, premium Grenache, you know, it gives all of these wines the same opportunity. And it also means that as a professional reviewer, I'm able to build into my review the extension of what the wine will become. You can taste that when you look at them on release, um, but it's just the pleasure that you don't get. As a reviewer, you don't have time for, to build in the pleasure into a review, so you have to just go with the nuts and bolts, which is sad but fair, and I think that's absolutely the way that it should be. So um, I hope that um, you bought some of these wines. I hope that you've got them already coming to you and on the way. Dan said that he had lots of orders, but he, like you know, thousands of emails from people asking questions about the wines, about the vintage, about the service. He's very busy right now. I'm sure that he will get back to you Um but he and his wife, Nicole, they're, they're a two-person band over there, so they're busy. Uh, and um, I think we should always keep that in mind. In terms also, one other thing that I would like to mention is my kind of independence on this video. So I started drinking the Standish wines in 2010, which I admit is late to the party. You know, I'm sure you all started in 1999 with the first wine. I was a little late. Um, but had a bottle shop, bought these wines in, and would always, um, people would flock to them. I loved drinking them. So obviously in 2010, the vintage I was drinking was 2008 and then from there. Um, over the years, I've developed a friendship with Dan, but it's a great relief to me as a professional that his wines are extraordinarily high quality every year. 
um, it's a very different thing, a friendship and a review. And I try and keep them very, very separate. Uh, but it's difficult not to like him for what he's doing. I mean, this is a really purest lens right here. We're just looking at Barossa Valley Shiraz. It's cool. Or Barossa Shiraz, I should say. It's really cool. So um, anyhow, drink well. Uh, I hope that you get to look at these wines. Maybe if you bought a few, you can open some early, but I would probably try and hold on to them for a couple of years before you start to delve in and explore. Although I always do recommend having a little look just to see what you're dealing with. See if you agree or disagree. God, they're opening up so beautifully. Yeah, cool. Really cool. How lucky are we? Drink well. <laughs>